Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collider Mailbag. This is the show where on the weekends, we take your viewer submitted questions that you can send to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. And we answer a bunch of them. We also answer them during the week on Movie Talk. But this show is just dedicated just to the mailbag. Joining me this week, we have Mark Riley. Hey, everyone. It's good to be here again. I love answering you guys' question. I had fun last weekend. And also the lovely Wendy Lee. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys. All right, let's get started. What's the first question? Kamar Tiller writes, Hello, Collider. I have watched for a long time and love the new shows. It's evident in all the hard work you put in. My question is, with the appearance of former mid-budget level movie franchises like Lethal Weapon and Rush Hour becoming TV shows, both great buddy cop franchises, will we see more TV show in this vein because of the disappearance of the mid-budget genre movies? Thanks and shred on. Uh, I think it's it's something that already was a natural fit with television series. We already had like Starsky and Hutch. We had Hawaii mm-hmm. Five O. We had Miami Vice. Mm-hmm. Even some newer stuff like Southland, where there's been this kind of buddy cop dynamic. Will the trend continue? I mean, really, it depends on how these do. I mean, I know. I think Rush Hour did not get re- received very no. well. Yeah. Lethal Weapon isn't out yet, right? That's uh, mm-hmm. on its way. Yeah, Lethal Weapon's coming. They just announced it. So. Yeah, I mean, if these shows, you know, do well, then then I, I can foresee them doing more of them. It definitely is a genre, at least now a days, fit more for TV. Right now, what he's talking about with the the mid budget jo- uh, genre films, they're not really happening because they want the big spectacle, the big tentpole movies that can get people into the theaters, and and just you know a buddy cop thing just doesn't really pull people into the theaters anymore. But people are willing to sit at home and, and watch it on their television series. Um, I I have to admit, I'm a fan uh, of the the new Hawaii Five O. Nice. I, I like the dynamic between the characters. You know, is is it great television? Not really, <laughs> but it's fun and entertaining. And it's silly, and I like watching it. What about you, Riley? Yeah, I think uh, you know the one thing that from this question that that scares me is losing these mid mid budget movies that I grew up with, Lethal Weapon, um, especially that one. It's interesting to see. I'm, I'm interested to see how it's going to translate to television. I think that the reason they're on television now, these they're branded. It's, TVs are essentially like movies as well. They want a branded title. So Lethal Weapon, you immediately go, oh, I know that, and you're going to go tune in and watch it. Um, as far as the movies, I'm really hoping The Nice Guys does well at theaters because yeah, yeah, it kind right. of reminds mm-hmm. me of Lethal Weapon. I mean, it's Shane Black. Shane Black wrote Lethal Weapon, so mm-hmm. he's doing uh, The Nice Guys. So it'll be interesting to see. I don't know. Wendy, what do you think? Maybe we can get a nice guy TV show out of it. Well, I don't yeah. know, because Miami Vice, that was a TV show first, right? Yes. But the movie didn't really work for me. Uh, <laughs> right. I actually didn't watch the movie. The it movie's, uh, it's really serious. It's it's Michael Mann, which yeah. he created My- Miami Vice, and mm-hmm. so then he did a very, very dark version of Miami Vice, like straight up heat. So it oh. was uh, it was interesting. I liked it. <laughs> okay. I just feel like it just really depends on the property. Like, I really thought Rush Hour was going to work. Mm. And then I saw the pilot. I'm like, this is not working at all. And then I turned it off. Yeah. So, um, but I definitely don't want to lose those mid-range budget movies. I think those were fun and those are casual for the general fans. Not everybody's always like, let's go see a superhero movie, comic book movie every weekend. So those would be nice to have. And I, you know, don't want to see them completely disappear and just be like, let's put those on TV only. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just uh, buddy cop movies. Mm-hmm. We're talking about just mid-budget dramas now are, are leaving. You're seeing a lot more stuff go to television or on demand where maybe it's a drum or thriller that maybe won't open that big at the theaters and they'll do kind of a day and date thing where they open the theaters but at the same time you can you can either purchase it for rent or right. on one of the VOD platforms. Yeah. All right, what's next? Lance Mack writes, "Hey Collider crew, thanks for giving me my daily dose of commuter entertainment." So, Batman v Superman makes $328 million domestic and $870 million worldwide, and it's labeled a disappointment. Civil War makes $296 million domestic and $940 million worldwide in two weeks. And everyone I hear analyzing this talk about superhero fatigue and BVS giving Civil War a sagging box office. Does a tenfold movie now have to make a billion dollars for it to be not considered a failure? Is this true? Does a studio really lose money if a film does not make a billion dollars? Is this a product of unrealistic expectations or are films becoming so ridiculously expensive to make that a billion is required? If 
so, shouldn't studios ring in big budget producers or directors instead of proclaiming the comic book film genre is f- as flagging? Thanks and keep bringing the filthy. Well, it has to do with expectations. They expected, I think the projections for Batman v Superman were 1.2 or $1.3 billion. Yeah. Wow. And it got $850 million. I don't think they lost money on it. And they probably made some money, but it wasn't what they were expecting. It's, you know, it's it's hard to determine because I'm sure there's a lot of things people in, in your own life where you work really hard on something and you were expecting a certain result. Mm-hmm. And you didn't get quite that result and you didn't fail at it, but you were disappointed. And I feel like that's what happened with Warner Bros. And the proof in the disappointment, because there are still deniers out there, whether you love the film or not, about it being a disappointment. It obviously was because Warner Brothers had a big shakeup this past week. You know, yeah. talk, like yeah. having, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Johns and uh, what was that guy? John, John Berg. Berg. Yeah. Like th- th- they're trying to in their minds fix the problem and they want to make it they 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 didn't get into the bat you know the batman v superman game to make 850 million dollars as as ludicrous amount of money that is they wanted over a billion dollars they want you know all these movies to make lots of money and the reason why they're expecting so much is they're putting so much money yeah. in i think batman v superman cost 300 million dollars to make and then you have to add on marketing costs and so it, it's one of those things now where in, in in the last question we talked about they are they need to create something that will bring people into the theaters to watch them and, and it doesn't seem like like a lot of these like mid-range movies can do that people would be like eh, i'll just stay at home and i'll wait till it's either on rental or netflix or vod or I'll watch a TV series that fills my need for that. The one thing you can't get at home is these big spectacle films. I mean, even right. if you're watching something like The Avengers, the yeah. first one, right. at home, you still like it. It's not the same experience as when you went to the theater and saw it on the big screen with the audience and the crowd and the, the great mm-hmm. sound. It's it's just not. And so that's why they keep making these movies and they keep throwing more and more money at it. Riley, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think... As they keep throwing money at these movies, then they're going to keep expecting it and needing it to hit a billion dollars. Like Batman v Superman. They were, yeah, Dennis, you're absolutely right. They're projecting so much. And when you think about the marketing behind it, I mean, there was everywhere I went, I was eating cereal that were (laughs) shaped in (laughs) Batman and Superman and eating Doritos with a freaking Bat logo. That all is money. That's just like, oh my God, it gets overwhelming. Um, You know, but when they just have to, these studios have to kind of, I wish they, you were talking about this, Dennis, it's making me think about the 80s and these original movies that came out had nothing to do with a a brand recognition. It was just like, you know what, Spielberg wants to make a movie about a a, a kid and and an alien and it it was the highest grossing movie still to this day, uh, uh, you know, maybe top 10, top 20 of all time. And that was an original movie. Now we have, has to be branded, just like we said in the last question. TV, same deal, Lethal Weapon, a title that people know, and so they want to hedge their bet. They're going to put so much money in, only if people remember it or, and know it. I mean, I hear that there's projections. They get a project. I was um, uh, interning at Village Roadshow, mm-hmm. and they would get these comic book things, and they would do like marketing research. How many people know this? What would that translate to into box office dollars? And then they would determine that budget, and then they're flooding the marketplace with it and the marketing and they're hoping and i tweeted out after civil war where i was like remember when it it was like it made a hundred million dollars opening weekend and everybody's like oh my god that's amazing now it's if it doesn't make 200 million mm. now we're like uh oh and now it's like if it doesn't make a billion uh oh i mean yeah it's it's insane well i want to ask you guys this because you t- you both talked about the projections. so what factors goes into like their projections is it just marketing is it like the cost for production marketing and they also do research on the audience and they look at okay see the thing is is batman v superman actually opened pretty big not too far behind civil war like 160 something yeah 167 Mm -hmm. i think but it had a steep drop off and then it through the weeks it, it yeah kept going down and down and so they didn't they didn't expect that kind of drop off they were thinking okay all these people have pre-bought their tickets there's a lot of excitement because the trailers were really the first and third trailer were really good yeah and so i think the excitement level was very high but then the word of mouth started to spread Mm -hmm. and the 
people saw the critics ratings and so it just didn't do as well in the long run as they expected yeah and, and especially when they're going they really need that word of mouth to give it legs mm -hmm. and they're really trying to hit that like 200 million box office because if it's not good then they're like oh geez we and i guarantee you merchandising is affected by it because think yep. about i like batman v superman i didn't hate the movie i just mm. but i was disappointed i liked it but i didn't like enough to be like i bought like a bunch of like batman v superman things but yeah. as soon as i saw the movie i was like i'm not <laughs> buying any more batman v superman stuff you know yeah, what i mean yeah i'm sure their merchandising took a hit as well yeah i'm sure it did all right, what's next? Bam Martin 8888 writes, Hey, Collider Movie Crew. I watch you guys every day and enjoy every minute of it. My question is, are we in the era of immediate gratification? Prior to the MCU and DCU days, we would have to wait years and years for sequels to be released, i.e. Dark Knight 2008 and Dark Knight Rises in 2012. Looking back at it, that's an extremely long time to wait for a sequel. Do you think the MCU and DCU are pumping out movies so quickly because they recognize that the audience has a shorter attention span now? Thanks and keep on keeping on. I think you're right with short attention spans. Also, I would say more competition, yeah. not just amongst uh, like, oh, you have a superhero movie and you have a superhero movie. I think it's more of, well, now people can stay at home and watch Netflix, watch TV, play video games, watch YouTube videos. Like mm -hmm. these are all things that are factored in. And so the reason why now the, the, the releases are, you know, one after another after another is because they want to keep it in the public consciousness they want you to know that okay that's why uh if you watch it ever watch a marvel movie at the end they'll show the end credit yeah. scenes and then they'll say so and so will return yeah you know because yeah. they're like look we want these people to know that that they're not investing their time in this for no reason that they're going to get something relatively soon riley what do you think yeah i thank god at the end of civil war that spider-man will return because I was worried there for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It's it. I when I read this question, I was like, yeah, it's it's starting to become. I mean, we're into this really crazy social media phase where it's instant gratification. You get these trailers now, and I worked websites for years and years and years, and you would want them to go to your website, right? Read all the stuff. Now they just get it on Facebook. They just get the title. That's it. They comment. They watch the trailer, and they're moving on. So it's like almost like this constant need for eating up all this. Uh, this the stuff that we want to see. And so, yeah, you got to keep it in the public consciousness to keep it. Like we were just talking about, uh, me and Christian were just talking about episode eight mm. and we're like, Oh, remember when it was coming out in May of 2018? <laughs> yeah. Now we got to wait till December. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, cause we're in a star Wars Renaissance right now. So everybody wants to see it. Same with Marvel, same with DC. They're going to keep doing it until the, the, the returns stop then mm -hmm. we might see it cool off a bit, at least for that genre. Then it could go, we might have a new genre come out, like maybe horror will have a renaissance or, um, I don't know, sci-fi sci fantasy, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think, Winnie? No, I totally agree. I mean, I am personally like an instant gratification kind of girl. Mm. So it's especially with these MCU movies and, and we get the end credit and it's like so-and-so return and it's keeping my interest. It's like I want to keep going back and keep um, updated on like what what I'm getting next so I think especially with social media yeah everybody is just like oh look new trailer all right move on yep. all right new and then I think that it's like the studios they have to keep up with how quickly social media is moving through if you don't keep up you're gonna get run over and then you're gonna lose your franchise absolutely on a side note do you ever guys ever go to the theater and watch a like a Marvel movie and as soon as the credits go most of the people are saying and then you see some people get up yeah. and start leaving aren't you like don't you want to like tell them to stay like hey, oh yeah yeah you oh yeah we did that with with civil war and i and i look at my girlfriend and i go rookies yeah <laughs> you know they're just like well that was a great movie i'm out of here and i'm like you're gonna miss it adam did that when we went to see civil war and i saw him leave and i said to dennis but doesn't he know this is a marvel movie why is he leaving adam 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 was like <laughs> he's just Clear. like bye yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right, what's next? Atik Now Rose writes, Hey, guys, just wanted to know if you've had a favorite guilty pleasure movie genre. I personally love Big Monster, a.k.a. kaiju movies like Godzilla, Pacific Rim, and Cloverfield. Shake my head at 10 Cloverfield Lane. The <laughs> spectacle of it makes me feel like a kid again. Thanks. Well, that's not a guilty pleasure genre for me because I'm a fan of that genre. Yeah. I like the big monster movies I, i'm guessing he's uh, shaking his head at uh, 10 clover hill lane because he probably thought that was going to fit into that genre and it 
definitely did not. Ah. Uh, but for me, it's tough. I guess I, I mentioned this on another show. Sometimes I find myself watching rom-coms or teen rom-coms, like just because hey yeah. even if I know they're not good, I just like, <laughs> I just you know, like I'm in that mood, right? For something lighter mm -hmm. and I'll watch it and I was just like, I know this isn't going to be good, but I'm just going to watch it anyways. I, I, I Like a month or two ago, I watched uh, that movie, The Duff, that was on <laughs> oh, HBO. Yeah. Yeah. The Designated Ugly Fat Friend or whatever. <laughs> Is I that mean, what it stands I, for? Yeah, that's what it stands that's for. That's what it stood for, yeah. And it's like a teenage rom-com, and I just, <laughs> all right, yeah. I'll just watch it. What's your guilty pleasure genre? Oh, man, I if there's a, a shark in it, I'm going to okay. watch the hell out of that movie. And I don't care how bad it is. Sharknado. Mm -hmm. um, it started with Jaws, but Jaws is arguably one of the best movies ever made. I love it. But when it started getting to Jaws 2, Jaws 3, Jaws the Revenge. Oh, yeah. I'm going to watch that. They're awful, awful, awful movies. I mean, the shark in Jaws the Revenge follows the Brodies from Amity to the Bahamas. <laughs> I mean, how awesome is that? So, yeah, I'm going to watch those. Another one is like, you know, horror movies. I'm a huge horror uh, fan. So bad horror movies, the straight to d DVDs or videos, I will watch those because mm -hmm. I love them. And Dennis, I'm with you. I will watch a romantic comedy. <laughs> I love them. I love these, these like, I know it's going to be stupid. And but, bad and cliche. And bad and, and cliche. And you see everything coming. Yeah, but I'm like, okay. I mean, the girlfriend wants to watch it. And I'm just like, yeah, all right. And she's like, really? I didn't think you would. And I'm like. I'm doing it for you, honey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you. Wendy, what's your what's your guilty pleasure genre? Uh, well, I love like the spy espionage type movie. Mm. So you know, I love those uh, Mission Impossible franchises. I really like Mr. and Mrs. Smith because that threw in a little bit of like romantic comedy in there with yeah. action and and ass kicking. And then this is the true guilty pleasure. It's like the young adult stuff, like Twilight, Beautiful Creatures, oh, more yeah. instrument. They're bad movies, man. Hey. But, why they call them guilty yeah, pleasures. Exactly. <laughs> Just no one knows that I actually go to the theater and watch them. It's like, one ticket, please. <laughs> <laughs> Just me. All right, what's next? Marlon Tuttle writes, Hey, Collider, love all the shows. Been watching for several months now and still look forward to it, all of it, every day. Especially looking forward to the horror show. My question is, is there a difference between a period piece and a movie that is just set in a different time period? If so, what is it? It seems like I hear that term a lot lately, but it doesn't always seem to fit. When I think period piece, for some reason, I think Shakespearean drama, not Captain America. Am I just misunderstanding it? What makes something a period piece? Thanks for all you do. P.S. I've been watching for a while, but not long enough. What's the story behind Bring the Filthy? <laughs> well, with Bring the Filthy, that's uh, you have to ask John Campy about that. <laughs> that's something that came up. It has, it has something to do with Fifty Shades yeah. of Grey, answering a, a mailbag question about Fifty Shades of Grey. No, in funny. terms of period piece, yeah, it's just something set in, in the past that's during a like a historical time, and it, technically, even something set in the '80s is is a period piece as long as it's not in modern times. It's weird. Okay, so. Today, if we shoot a movie and it's set in the 80s and we have all the 80s culture and the 80s setting, that's a period piece. But a movie in the 80s that was shot about the 80s, that's not a period piece because that was shot in the modern times. So Good way it, to put it. A, yeah, it's a, it's a historical stuff. You, one thing, future stuff doesn't, you know, alternate realities don't really... Uh, like different worlds, that's not a period piece. But anything historical, yeah, you, the 1930s... It, anything like that we generally though kind of think of them as those kind of british ones the ones that david griffin loves so much that he loves like <laughs> was it downton abbey yeah downton abbey <laughs> I, I watched downton abbey that's probably a guilty pleasure of mine but i mean he likes a lot of those he watches like mr selfridge and like all of like wow yeah sensitive. like uh, riley any other uh, yeah thoughts on that? i think of the remains of the day yeah howard's end yeah those those are the movies that came out i remember like my grandmother like wanting to see those and, and I always just thought, yes, those are the period pieces. So I get it. Like the, the Shakespeare's and, and whatnot. But yeah, Dennis, you said it. It's if they're if they like Captain America, yeah, they did when it was announced the first Avenger, they're like, it's gonna be a period piece. And I'm like, what? They're gonna go back in the World War Two? Awesome. So yeah, it's just like the time frame and you know, yeah, if we're gonna shoot like uh Warren Beatty was just announced making uh his next movie in fifteen years or so. And it's Howard Hughes, and uh, that's a period piece. So that'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. What's next? Or Ophelia writes, hey, Collider crew. 
Thanks for all the amazing daily content that you provide us. Watching your show is way more fun than studying for final exams. My question is about de-aging older actors and actresses using CGI. We've seen awesome example of this lately, mainly with Michael Douglas in Ant-Man, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator Genesis, and Robert Downey Jr. in Civil War. But those de-aged versions of these, these actors only appear for a couple of minutes within their respective films. Do you think it would be possible, or should we use this technology to have older actors play roles for younger people? Why cast a Meryl Streep-like actor in her mid-20s when you can get the real Meryl Streep and just de-age her using CGI makeup? And do you think the hardcore Star Wars fan would be more accepting of a young Han Solo movie if the real Harrison Ford were to reprise his role as Han Solo but with the same CGI applied to him. Would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks again for taking my question and may the insert chipmunk face be with you. <laughs> yeah, of course, if, if Harrison Ford was able to de-age himself and, and star in a, a young Han Solo movie, I, th I do think fans would be more accepting. But the, the point right now is the reason why they don't do it is the technology isn't there yet. Yeah. There's a reason why these scenes are so short. Yeah. In you see it at the beginning of Ant-Man with Michael Douglas. You see it in Civil War with Robert Downey Jr. It works for the short scenes and within the context of why you would have them. But if you were to do a whole movie with it, it's just not there yet. You, yeah. You'd watch it and it would take you out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, even that short sequence with Robert Downey Jr. in Civil War, it's like you can see that clearly it's not him. Uh, Riley, what do you think? Yeah, it's it's kind of scary, though, to think that it could happen sooner or later. I, I don't know. It's, it's what I got from it. I read this and I was like, ooh, God, that's a good point. It could happen someday we're not close um and i think too it's, it must be insanely expensive so can you imagine doing a whole movie like how how much would that be that would, that seems crazy to me um yeah and that's not why they're not going to do it and i mean that there's a lot to, and then like han solo like harrison ford would do it he couldn't do the running around anymore like like a young han solo would do sorry harrison i know you you had a, a door fall on you and you took a month off. So, um, but hey, he flies planes. He flies planes. Dude, the guy walked away from a plane crash. Yeah. Didn't he crash like, like in he, a golf field? Yeah. Golf, golf course. The guy flew. He knew where to crash. <laughs> That's how good he is. So I just don't think the, yeah, the technology's not there yet. And I, I think it would be insanely expensive. However, I'm worried that sooner or later, a Skynet's going to go, uh, you know, <laughs> sentient and, and, and it's going to happen. And maybe 20 years down the line. I don't know, Wendy. Do you I think? think it can. I think it happened. Uh, it can happen. I think they've got a long way to go. Yeah. The first time I ever saw this type of technology was in like that Tron reboot. Yeah, when yeah. They took Jeffrey Tron Bridges Legacy. And, and yeah, and they and they and I was like, what? But doesn't it slightly creep you guys out just a little bit? Because yeah, yes, because it's when, not there. Yeah, it's not there yet. So it's like it's very mechanical, and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, that's weirds me out just a little bit. It's like when I got really weirded out with Chris Evans being like the puny. In Avengers, yeah. in the first Avengers, and like that freaked me out too. Yeah. For me, that one worked better though because they kind of just were able to kind of shrink them down and put them into like a smaller mm -hmm. body where the de aging is like, you can literally kind of see that it's not, it's not quite, real. quite there. Yeah. You know what though I am impressed at is instead of the de aging, is the aging effects on the digital Benjamin because um, in Captain America Winter Soldier, you had. Uh, Haley Atwell played Peggy Carter as an older oh. person, yeah. and that was all digital effects. I had thought that it was prosthetics oh. because in the in the makeup community, that. the prosthetics is one of the hardest things to do is to age someone up. That's mm -hmm. why if you watch old movies with like the people are playing older people, it always looks so silly. Yeah, looks yeah. so it's silly. Hard. Yeah, and they did such a good job with the the aging effect on her and and then i i read that it was digital and i was like oh wow that looked great i mean granted she was in a stationary <laughs> position you know what i mean yeah yeah she wasn't moving around and whatnot so that probably helped it but i thought that actually looked much more impressive but in this you know it's, it's hollywood they always want to go younger they're not trying to get older so <laughs> right. they, you right. know they they want to and we had another question maybe uh either during movie talk or mailbag about getting stars that were passed away and getting digital representations of them. I think that's almost kind of the same thing as this de-aging process. Yeah, I think you're right that it is the, the same yeah. thing. And, and it could be, I mean, we're talking about the holograms having Tupac play at yeah. Coachella, you know, yeah. it's kind of the same idea. 
I just, it just scares me. Technology is scary, man. <laughs> it's getting to this point where I'm, I'm turning into my father. You're gonna have like God. a hologram, Mark Riley and Dennis Zen walking around, doppelganger. Well, yeah, hey. we, talk, we talked about like, oh yeah, instead of like coming to do the show, we'll do the show from home, but our holograms <laughs> will appear. <laughs> yeah. So all three holograms <laughs> will appear on the sets. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be it's, cool. Riley just went to the bathroom. I think that'd be weird. <laughs> all right, what's next? Joe Tyndall writes, I've never understood why, for all the changes he's made, George Lucas didn't go back and add the Imperial theme into A New Hope. Any ideas? Not sure, but apparently when he goes back to mess with his old films, he doesn't like making them better. So <laughs> that's probably why. He was like, oh, will this make it better? Nah. <laughs> not going to do it. Not going to do it. Uh, yeah. What burn, do you think? Baby, I know. I read this and I just wanted to geek out a little bit because it's like, yeah, why didn't he? That would have made it better. I could see it totally working. He has a against the making it better policy. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, for this particular one, it would have totally fit. I don't, I mean, you know, they're flying towards the Death Star and there's, you know, just, I, I mean, maybe it's because they would have had to do new music and they don't want to pay Williams to do a little bit more or mm -hmm. just taking already released so it could have been a number of things i think yeah i think lucas wasn't even thinking that way i think he's literally thinking i need to make this better technology wise yes yeah, so let me get all these little alien creatures at mouse Eisley that like totally stand out like to it's not like hey let's decorate the background it's like woo. Like, yeah. like, no, <laughs> you know like oh the, the, sh the little land speeder passes by like they, they make it, he makes it so obvious that yeah. they're there god and it's oh god i remember seeing that finally and i was like what is going on it just it took away so much going back into the cantina too which is, now it's becoming a rant or something sorry guys it, it just yeah to see all those new digital creatures and especially yeah, instead of the awesome prosthetic ones that were yeah. made that yeah. fit with what the scene was yeah it's weird yeah he should have gone back he should have added the imperial march it would have been awesome so. he was always about to me just like what's what's new and shiny and let's put that in there instead of staying true to what it was yeah he didn't i mean my god luke turns off the targeting computer at the end he doesn't want technology he's gonna use the force <laughs> lucas goes back and goes no more technology so. <laughs> no right. music either what's the last one all right king lino 340 writes hey guys i'm a new fan to the show i've been following you guys for about a month now and i must say i absolutely love the content great work okay so my question is the matrix at this point is the most if not the only successful movie for the wachowski brothers now the wachowski sisters is there any way you guys think this can be rebooted or a continuation or even selling it to someone else so they can carry on like Disney is doing with Star Wars? I feel the Matrix still has a lot they can do with such a cool world. If you guys had to re if you guys had to make another Matrix, what would you guys do? Reboot or sequel and how? Thanks guys, keep up the good work. Hope my question makes the show. Your fan from US Virgin Islands. I actually think it's the Wachowski siblings, not the sisters, because I think only one of them had the sex change. Yeah. Uh, in terms of more Matrix, well, that's, I think, more up to Warner Brothers than the Wachowski brothers, because I yeah. think Warner Brothers owns the rights to them. It's not like a Lucas situation where he magically, you know, not magically, but he had the foresight to, yeah. to, to get the rights to, to Star Wars. Uh they're not going to bring back the Wachowski brothers for it. if if they decide if they decide that doing the Matrix again rebooting or redoing a sequel they're not going to get them back because the track record for the Wachowski brothers lately has not been good at the box office it's not yeah. one of those things where look like as much as I you know bash on Michael Bay or whatever I still understand logically why the studio keeps bringing him back he makes them money yeah that's the whole job that, that for the for them, they're like, oh, he makes a movie and people go watch it and we make money. So let's retain him. Where Wachowski's now, they can't they can't even say that. They're not making the studios any money. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think they would bring them back. In terms of what I would like to see, I, I think at this point, a reboot, because if you did a sequel, how do you explain that storyline? You gotta bring Keanu Reeves, you gotta bring Lawrence Fishburne, you gotta bring everyone back, Harry Ann Moss. I don't know where the story goes after what happened at the end of the third Matrix. I think rebooting it would be good. Also, the first one's great. The second one, like take out all that stuff about Zion and the stupid rave cave and all those stupid <laughs> people dancing. <laughs> rave cave. Yeah, because like that 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 took me out right away. I I am not a fan of, of the the last two in the trilogy, and so 
Why not keep it in the Matrix? It's called the Matrix. When, shouldn't you spend your time in the Matrix? That's what the first one did, and that's why we we all love that one. Yeah. Um. So that's what I would do, Riley. Yeah, you started to sway me. I was saying sequel, mm -hmm. and then you're right. I mean, yeah, I guess you. I guess it would work better as a reboot, but um, I don't know. Talk about guilty movie pleasures. I could watch The Matrix. Like, if it's on, I'll watch it. You're talking about the second and third one? The second and third one. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. the, the first one is a masterpiece. Yeah. I love that movie. Um, the second and third, maybe it's because of my love with the, the first one that I give a pass to part two and three. But yeah, they're 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 a mess. I didn't. I couldn't. I still don't know what the hell that ending is with the third one. I don't. What that she's still alive, and then the sun came up. I don't it's know what's weird. going. On. So I don't know. I think Warner Brothers sooner or later will reboot it. I think it's one of those things that they're going to go back and they're going to look and go, hey, Matrix. You know, that's what it seems to be. Mm -hmm. They'll reboot again. It's a brand. Everybody knows the Matrix. So a reboot would be interesting. Depends on who the directors are, but I don't know if we'll we'll see it for a while. What do you think? I would want to see a reboot, not a sequel. Yeah. Because we've already had two and three, and those obviously did not work out very well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering now if, let's just say, a, a sequel or a reboot is greenlit, who would you guys want as Neil, or would you want a completely different character? Ooh. I would want a completely different character, to yeah. be honest. I, yeah. I want something, you know, have, have the concept of the Matrix, but then have a new new perspective on a new take on that yeah like the one you mean mm -hmm, like who would mm -hmm. be the one yeah i mean i think it's primed for a you know a female centric ah, the one cool. you know um so i think they could go that way um i would love did you ever see the uh, the animatrix yeah i did mm -hmm. yeah i really like that there's a, there's a lot of story there that's really cool and it, yeah it takes place in the matrix so there's so many you don't even need to do the one yet. It could be leading up. Maybe it's a trilogy to right. find the one. I don't know. There's. A I lot. enjoyed the Animatrix yeah. much more than the last Me too. two mm -hmm. films. Agreed. The Me last too. two films are. You know how like some people say when they watch the Rocky franchise that Rocky Five they just kind of pretend it never happened. Yeah. That's me in the last two Matrix movies because so. it's like so the first one happened. And I don't know what the hell the other two are. Yeah. You had uh, Colonel Sanders in one of them <laughs> trying to explain some stuff. Uh, it was, yeah. I try and forget. I I don't know if I've seen those movies. I may have seen them one. Yeah, I probably saw them one more time after. I saw them in the theaters, and then I watched them at home once each. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that's enough yeah. for yeah. me. Mm -hmm. I get it. All right. All right, guys. Uh, that's it for Collider Mailbag. I want to thank the people joining us at the table today. Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Mark Riley? You can find me at Riley Around on Twitter and on Instagram, and I pop up here on a Collider video all the time and at Collider.com. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Here on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. You can find me on Movie Talk, usually on Mondays and Fridays. You'll see, catch me on some spoiler reviews, some other, you know, mailbag on the weekends, things like that. Uh, what else have we got? We got TV Talk coming up tomorrow, obviously Movie Talk, Jedi Council of Heroes. And we have some new shows coming up as well, and you'll learn about those soon enough. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Collider Videos. And we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.